Today we're going to start a new series. We kind of did an intro last week, um, and the series is basically it's on the on the life of Joseph. But the concept is when life doesn't make sense, or as I like to call it, man, I didn't see that coming. And last week, you if you were here, you remember that we talked about um, some misconceptions that we have oftentimes about when life doesn't make sense, and and we we went through some of the processes in the flesh that we deal with. And you remember, if you were here, you saw the awesome video of Tommy getting leveled on the football field. Um, I don't have a video today. However, we are going to start looking at the life of Joseph. And you'll find the life of Joseph in the Bible from Genesis chapter 37 through Genesis chapter 50. Uh, I did not put individual verses up today because we all have Bibles or on our phones have Bibles. And we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 37 perusing through different sections of it. So I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles with you today, or you have your uh, personal device, open it up to your favorite Bible app and look at Genesis chapter 37. Uh, probably a lot of us are familiar, at least in part, with the story of Joseph. We know about the, the coat of many colors. We know about being sold into slavery. We know a, a lot of the, the, the details. But today I want us to kind of look at it from the perspective that Actually, the story of Joseph is one of the most intriguing, dramatic, and incredible life stories in the Bible. There is nothing, nobody else's life really compares to the things that Joseph went through, the, the struggles, the tribulations, the triumphs. Um, and, and in a great way, and, and in many ways, other Bible scholars, I don't consider myself one, but there are some, and they will also agree that in many ways, Joseph's story is somewhat a picture of the life of Jesus in that he was, there was love, there was betrayal, there's forgiveness, there's redemption, all of the things that took place. And so as we kind of look at it today, I want us to be mindful of the concept that in many ways it seems that Joseph's life and reality in our own life, oftentimes nothing ever goes the way that we expect it to go. Would that be an agreeable statement? Uh, I look back over my life and I have all of these pictures of what I thought stuff should be only to find out that the, expect, the reality didn't match the expectation. Um, and so today, I can look in the life of Joseph and look back over my life and think of so many instances when I too just didn't see that coming. I had a picture of how life was going to be based on where I was and what was taking place, and the outcome absolutely was not anything near what my expectation was. And so over the next few weeks, I want us to be looking through the life of Joseph for some basic truths that we do need to remember. And we need to remember them because we all are going to face times when life doesn't make sense. We all are going to get there. We're all going to encounter those times. And, and, and we will stand along with Tommy on the football field, Jeff in the pulpit, and everybody else say, man, I just did not see this coming. This is not what I expected. So if you have your Bibles open, to Genesis chapter 37, I want to read the first four verses of this passage. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. That's an important statement. Now Israel loved Joseph more than, the, than any uh, other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Anybody ever have a situation where people misread you, misinterpreted you, looked at something that you did, with skewed views and just life turned weird. Anybody ever been there? If not, I want us to think about something. There's a simple truth in these first passages. Doing the right thing marks you. Doing the right thing marks you. My dad used to have a saying that I've tried to put it into practice in my life, and I may have uh, shared it before, but my dad always used to tell me, that doing right is better than being right. Doing what's right is always better than being right. 
Now, in this particular passage, I know we're having to read a little bit in, but there's, there's a pattern in the life of Joseph that plays itself out from the first time we meet him here in chapter 37 to the, the very end in chapter 50. And the thing is, is that early on in Joseph's life, he established a pattern of life that was different than everybody else. He established a pattern of life that he was going to do what was right, even in the midst of all of this. Joseph knew that if he was going to be successful, that the key was to do things rightly. So when you look at this passage, and there's a lot of in between, I know that. But in verse 2, it says that he was out with his brothers tending sheep. Um, Joseph is a 17-year-old young man. Um, We also know that because he is Jacob's favorite son, there is some tension. Anybody ever grow up with sibling rivalry? Anybody ever been around that where there's there's people that don't like you just because they don't like you? Just because, and you're trying to walk a high road and everybody misreads that and they misinterpret that and they do all kinds of stuff. It's interesting, and the reason I said that a key component in this is that Joseph was out with his brothers doing brother stuff. They're watching sheep. They're out alone. All kinds of stuff. And I don't know what the bad report was, but it says that he came back to his father and he gave a bad report. I have a pretty good idea. I know what a group of guys out on their own do. Anybody else know that? And want to admit that? Joseph comes back, and I honestly believe because of the pattern that we see all through the life of Joseph, that he disagrees with the bad behavior of his brothers, and he comes back to report to his father. Why would he do that? Is he just a bratty tattletale? Is he trying to get his brothers in trouble? Is he What's the motive behind that? I honestly think based on the life of Joseph. No. He was sincere about doing what's right. And he called it out when it wasn't. He had the nerve to call his brothers out on it. And not only call them out, but go tell dad, hey, I don't know, you need to know this information. This is what's taking place. You see, what happens is, whenever we decide to do what's right, everyone, not always, but the majority of people around us just don't like it. If we decide to take a high road, if we decide to walk a life of integrity, if we decide to do what nobody else is doing, they don't like it, and it immediately turns against us. Would you agree with that? I can only imagine the name-calling and the beat-downs that Joseph got from his older brothers. All of this stuff that's taking place. When we decide that we're not going to live like everybody else, when we decide that because we are children of God and God has given us a a direction, a mission, a purpose, and a path to successful life, when we decide to start walking that, isn't it interesting how many people become angry with us? Now, I don't know your life experience. I don't know. When we decide to live in a way that others aren't, it marks us, and we've all been marked at some extent. His brothers didn't understand it. Because being a good person, being a righteous person, always creates haters. They check your motives. They say, oh, got Jesus, did you? Oh, sure, but I know you. Yeah, this is just, this, this is just you. This is a phase you're going through. Anybody ever heard that? Have you ever had people that just immediately... When you, I, I rem, I'm, I'm all over the place. Give me a moment to catch myself because I've been like running wide open for days building this sermon. Um, I remember specifically in high school, we had a Youth for Christ revival and there were a lot of guys in my circle of, of, of age of, of guys that got saved. And there was a large group of guys that did not get saved. They did not even attend the revival. And the tension between those two groups is mind-boggling. When someone said, I gave my heart to the Lord, and, and they said, well, let's go to the river and get drunk, they go, no, man, I don't do that. All right, okay. And it marked them. And they immediately became this marked person, this holier-than-thou person, this person that nobody wants to do with. It created haters. And they say, I don't like you. I don't want to be around you. I disagree with you. Why? Because I'm doing the right thing? Always understand. When we choose to walk a walk with God, there are those that just don't get it. 
They just don't. But God does. God gets it. And I can't let the flesh pull me away from what I know is right. I can't let the distractions of my friends, family, or whoever it is that are calling me out and beating me down, calling me names, making fun of me, ostracizing me. I cannot allow that to deter me from the path of righteousness that God has set me on. Joseph would not allow it. Guys, I just want you to know, being a good person, being a child of God, will create haters in your world. Accept it. I don't want anybody to not like me. How about you? It just eats at me when somebody don't like me. It keeps me awake at night when somebody don't like me. But you know what I figured out? I can't fix that. I can either be nothing to everybody or I can be one thing to the Lord. Because no matter what direction I go, somebody's going to hate it. Joseph understood that and he set his sights on the Lord. And he followed a life of righteousness. Now, was he perfect? No. He's 17 years old. No. Was he maybe a little bit arrogant? Probably. But did he understand the difference between righteousness and sinfulness? Yeah. And he chose to walk with the Lord. In the next section, it gets even more intriguing. Not only do his brothers despise him because he, they went home and told dad all of the dumb stuff they're doing. But when we get to the next section of this, now God begins to work in Joseph's life in a very real way. In verse 5 it says, Now Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. They already hated him. How can you hate somebody more? But they did. And he said to them, Hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to, to my sheaf. I don't know what you think, but I'm thinking what you're thinking. He's saying, I'm going to stand up and you're going to bow down to me. He's the 17-year-old. These are all older brothers. His brother said, oh, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and words. Not only because he was trying to live a life of righteousness, because he was calling out sin against him, they hated him. Not because dad loved him, they hated him. Now because God is working in his life, they hate him even more. Man, Joseph just can't get a win here. But it continues. Then, in verse 9, he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers. Why did he go there? And he said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Why eleven? Anybody know? I'll let you answer. Yeah, eleven brothers. Not just a random number. The moon, the stars. They were bowing down. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? That's a hard question. Those that are in your corner even begin to question. Those that you go to and you know you can depend on even begin to look at it like, What are you doing? So they hated him even more for his words and dreams. And then in verse 11 it says, his brothers were what? Jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Second thing that we need to remember, not only does doing the right thing mark us and people ain't going to like it, but dreaming big God dreams isolates you. It will isolate you. When God starts moving in your life, when God starts moving you in a direction that is different from the accepted norm, instantly people begin to pull away. Instantly people begin to remove themselves from your life. So, just a quick question. How many of y'all, when you got saved, when you, when, when you gave your life to Christ 
and God began moving in your life and giving you direction, had the friend circle that you had just kind of disappear. Just kind of like dropped you like a hot rock. They just walked away. You see, in Joseph's life, God begins moving in his life and he's giving him dreams. And we know all of the story of Joseph, so we know where this is going to come into play. But at the time, Joseph didn't know the whole story. He just knew God was doing something and he's showing him things. And he's trying to share it with those closest to him. And they reject it. So when people begin to pull away, have you ever been told this? Hey, you're too churchy. Hey, you're too serious about this Jesus stuff. You're holier than thou. Any of these ringing bells out there? Hey, turn down the Jesus stuff a little bit. Back it up, bro. Just kind of be a normal Christian. Well, what is a normal Christian? Good question, isn't it? Is a normal Christian somebody that just attends church and says a prayer over dinner? Well, yeah. But when God starts moving in your heart, you move beyond just attending church and saying grace. You begin to dig into the Word of God and listen to the Spirit as He's moving you in, the, in directions. And it's life-changing. For Joseph, this is life-changing. And interestingly, often those that are the closest to us misunderstand us the most. Isn't that true? Those that are the closest to us, who should go, oh wow, Joseph, God is moving in you. I'm anxious to see what's happening. It should be his dad, Jacob. What's Jacob say? Hey, what do you mean? I'm going to bow down to you? What does his brothers do? You're just an arrogant little fool. I hate you. I want nothing to do with you. Why is it that those that are the closest to us seem to misunderstand us the most? Because they know us. And it hurts them to see. I'm, I'm going to be real honest. It hurts them. It strikes pain in their heart when they see you moving forward for God and they're not willing. And so they recoil and they react and they respond in a negative way. You know, sometimes our faith and our walk seems like it's an offense to people. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Man, I don't want to be offensive, do you? I mean, do I wake up every day saying, Lord, please give me an opportunity to offend somebody today. I want to offend them in Jesus' name. No, I don't. I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to push people away, but I also know that by walking in the Word of God and walking in absolute truth, I will offend somebody. And may I also point out this interesting fact. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is the most offensive statement in the world. Because when you tell somebody, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell, that's, rare, that's fairly offensive. Would you agree with that? It is an offense. But it's also absolute truth. So Joseph is having these big God dreams. He doesn't know exactly what it means. He just knows that God's moving in his world. And he wants to follow God. And he doesn't know exactly how this is going to play itself out. He just knows that it is important. And now he knows that his family took offense to his dreams. I want to remind us of something in the New Testament. Jesus began his public ministry. And he's healing people and casting out demons and he's teaching the, the Word of God and the Kingdom of Heaven. And his own mother and brothers came to gather him up because they thought he'd lost his mind. They said, he's crazy. Please, let's take him home. Something's not right. Now I've talked about this a lot. But in 1995, God put a burden in my heart, a calling on my life that I couldn't explain and I didn't. I kind of ran, actually it was late 94, all through 95. And I, I, I didn't know. I, I knew that what I was doing in church and I was faithful and I was teaching, and I, was, I was like, if we were just picking up cigarette butts in the parking lot, I was there because I felt this urge to be engaged in the ministry. Not that I'm super Christian, that's just where I was. And God put this thing in my heart that I needed, He wanted me to go into full-time ministry, preaching ministry. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And Sandra walked through that with me. And so, somewhere along early 95, mid-95, I remember the moment I was on my bass boat. It was a nice Ranger, 19-foot, 200-horse Evinrude. Bull Shoals Lake and the white bass were biting. And man, I was out there at night and I was by myself and I'm pulling in fish. Man, whoo, whoo, it's like, God is great. Another fish. God loves me. And he said, 
not in the audible, I wish, but you know that voice when the Holy Spirit just goes, hey. And the message was this. Are you going to spend your life fishing? Or are you going to follow me and be a fisher of men? Yeah, I use the Bible. So I'm calling you. What do you say? And I am trying to ignore the voice going, no, 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 no. But I hear it. Do you know what he did? I went from catching every cast to not a fish in the lake. Dead silence. And I'm throwing and nothing. I'm throwing and nothing. I'm throwing with nothing. Now, did he stop the fish's mouth? Did it get my attention? Yeah. So I come home and I tell Sandra, hey, God's called me to ministry. I don't know what this means. But I know it means something. I go to work. I tell my guys, I've been working these guys for 13 years. I said, hey, God's called me to ministry. And they go, you're crazy. You? No. I had one guy say, what do you do? Give you a phone call? What do you mean he called you? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. As we progressed in this process, I knew that at some point I had to walk away from my life as a lineman at the electric company and all that I knew and go to Bible college because I knew if I was going to preach, I had zero skills. I took shop class. And I knew I needed to go to college and prepare myself. And so I made the decision that we, I would quit my job and we would go to Bible college, move to Nashville, all of us, family, two kids, wife, no dogs at the time. And this is what we're going to do. You would not believe the opposition that arose instantly. They were okay with me being a preacher, whatever that means. They were okay with me going occasionally on Sunday and filling a pulpit here and there. They were cool with me like leading Bible study and being serious about my faith. But when I said, I'm walking away and following God, you had, you'd have thought that I had lost my ever-loving mind. And the opposition rose up and it rose up hard. And the accusations and the oppression that came from that was mind-boggling to me. I thought everybody would go, yay! We're so happy for you. We're so excited for you. Oh man, God's going to do great stuff. No, nobody said that. Everybody said, you're a fool. You're an absolute fool. Many times, People who follow God's calling in ministry, missions, or just to daily obedience in their life. They find the greatest opposition from those the closest to them. They don't want us to succeed. They don't want us to be different. They don't want us to move beyond where they are. And Joseph encounters this in a massive way. But remember, Even though they're not happy and they pull away when others don't get you and what you're doing with God. Always remember this. God gets it. God gets it. You're not alone in this. God gets it. So his brothers do something interesting. If you read through verses 12 and following, we're not going to go there, but know the story. Um, He is sent by his father to go check on his brothers. Hey, go see what they're doing. They see him coming and instantly they recognize the coat of many colors that daddy gave him. They recognize the dreamer, the one that thinks he's so much better than everybody else, the one that thinks God is speaking to him. They recognize him and instantly their disdain wells up inside them and they plot to kill him. Well, there you go. That's pretty Pretty bold, isn't it? And so they see Joseph coming and instantly this group of brothers that already don't like him, that that he's trying to live right, they don't want to and they plot to kill him. But it's not unanimous. Reuben doesn't want to do that. Reuben says, "Mm -mm -mm -mm, let's don't do that. So if you read through that, it's interesting. They don't want to deal with him anymore. They don't want to be bothered with him anymore. They really want to kill him But they don't know what to do. So what they do, they throw him in a pit. A hole in the ground. And this is fascinating. And then what do they do? They sit down to eat. Oh, there's Joseph. Let's kill him. No, let's don't kill him. We'll throw him in a hole. Okay, chuck him. What's for dinner?
I want to sound hateful, and I don't mean to, but let me be sure that the people that are opposing you in your walk of faith are not nearly as upset as you are by it. Their opposition doesn't affect them. Does that make sense to you? If you stew on it, dwell on it, wrestle with it, throw up over it, cry over it, they're just going to sit down and eat. Well, never be surprised. Please, never be surprised how offended other people are by your walk of faith. And I'm not trying to make this out to be holier than thou spiritual icons. I'm saying just regular folks trying to live life for Jesus. Don't ever be offended. Don't ever be surprised by the offense that it brings. Eventually they decide, you know what? Killing him doesn't make any sense, so let's uh, sell him. They see some Midianite traders coming along. Hey, let's make some money out of the deal. That way we don't have blood on our hands. So they sell him into slavery to the Midianites. You would think at this moment that Joseph's story is kind of heading downhill, and in circumstance, it kind of is. Not very long ago, he's the favored son at dad's house, and now he's being bound and sold into slavery down into Egypt. He had a dream that he was going to rise up above the family unit, and, and that, that for whatever reason, they would bow down to him, and now they've chained him up, tied him to the back of a camel, and he's walking his way to Egypt. Doesn't make sense. I didn't see that coming in the story of Joseph. He didn't see that coming in his life story. Nevertheless, here he is. But here's the problem. Joseph's story isn't over. You may get whacked out of left field and not clean unconscious. Somebody may do something, say something, abuse you in some way that, I don't know that it goes to the selling you into slavery level, but you know what I mean. Something pretty harsh. Don't stop there and think, well, man, this is all over. I've made a huge mistake. No. Joseph's story isn't over. Actually, it's only the beginning of the Joseph story. Because he's doing what is right. The third thing I want us to understand this morning and always remember is what the world sees as failure, God sees as an opportunity. He gets it. When the world looks at you and says, oh man, Obviously, God wasn't with you. You wouldn't have been sold into slavery. I hope that's never said about you. But, obviously, God isn't with you. Your life wouldn't be so rough right now. Obviously, you're not really the person of God that you think you are, or you wouldn't be sick, or you wouldn't be broke, or your kids would be angels, or you fill in the blank with all of that stuff. And I just want to tell you, hey, circumstances do not erase the walk of God and the power of God and the things that He has. When God looks at all of these circumstances that Joseph has just encountered, what does God see? An opportunity. A tremendous opportunity to do something in the life of Joseph that he would never do with anybody else in all of the Old Testament. An incredible opportunity. As you go through there, he's sold into slavery. They've got the whole, hey, let's kill a goat, dip his coat in it, tell dad he's dead. Dad mourns and weeps and all of this. You go th- and it's just this, this ter- tremendous story of deceit and betrayal and all of that going on by the brothers of Joseph. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, Joseph is on the auction block. And he's sold into slavery to the house of Potiphar. In verse 36, I want to bring our attention. And I, and, and I like the way that the, the, the Lord put this in words. We see all of this stuff about his robe and the fierce animal devoured him and Joseph torn to pieces and Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth. All of his sons and daughters rose up to comfort dad. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him to in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Who was he sold to? Not Jim Bob, the cotton farmer. Nothing against cotton farmers. But he wasn't sold out there. Where was he sold? He was sold into slavery, but to whom? An officer of Pharaoh. A captain of the guard. An important person in an important place. 
Do you think God doesn't have a bigger plan than what we can see? Everybody else looking at it like Joseph is a failure. Man, God must not be with him. He wouldn't be a slave today. He wouldn't have been sold. His life wouldn't be so miserable. His brothers wouldn't hate him. His dad wouldn't be mourning over him. He wouldn't be on the auction block. He wouldn't have been sold to this Egyptian guy. No, God says, wait a minute. What you don't understand is I get what's going on. It was quite a fall from the favored son to an Egyptian slave, isn't it? I mean, at any level, we have to look at that and go, wow, I did not see that. And I don't know what I, how I deal with that. And we can probably look at our life and see places where we have been up here and then just all at once the bottom fell out. And we're like, I've always been afraid that the elders were going to do something up here on the stage and put a trap door that I didn't know about when they get tired of me, just pull the button. That's kind of how life is. Pull the rug out from under you and you're just gone. Hey, I don't want to implant ideas in anybody's mind. Because the problem is the stage is only this tall, so I just fall down and you'd still see me. I'd just be a short me. <laughs> but here's the problem. Though he fell from the favored son to be the heir of the family to an Egyptian slave, the world saw that as a tremendous failure. A walk of faith believing in God that ended him in chains. A place nobody wants to be. And so often, we look at it and we think, man, his walk with God seemingly lost him everything. I have personal friends that have lost everything because of their faith in God. We live in a very uh, protected society. But I have dear friends that have lost their family. The family just discounted them and said, you're dead to me. I have friends that have lost their jobs because of their faith and trust in God. They would no longer do deals under the table. And so they didn't trust them and they lost their jobs. I have friends that have been cast out of a community and lost their home because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So we don't, we don't understand the depths of these sorts of things because we live in a very protected, safe zone, right? But Joseph didn't live in that protected, safe zone. Joseph chose to walk with God and it cost him everything. Everything. His family, his position, his freedom. He's the property of an Egyptian. How does that work? And so often we only see the immediate circumstances of what's going on, right? We only see the immediate circumstances of whatever it was that leveled us on the playing field, whatever came out of left field and tackled us. We only see the immediate circumstances of those things. And we judge them strictly with the flesh. We always immediately look at it from a fleshly concept and, and, and we miss the big point. We're all guilty at times of doing that, right? We look at something and we go, oh man, this is bad, this is all bad. I don't know about you, but to be uh, cast out of my family, sold into slavery by my brothers, wound up in chains in an Egyptian's house in a foreign land, circumstantial, that's pretty bad. It'd be easy in the flesh to go, I give up. God, you failed me. God, I tried the Jesus thing, didn't work for me, look where I am. Hey, maybe my faith just isn't strong. Maybe if I had better faith, these circumstances wouldn't have happened. Doesn't all of that run through our brain? The fact of the matter is, circumstances are irrelevant. God's plan is at play. And God gets it. And He's not as concerned about the fleshly things that we're concerned about because He has a big picture. And you have a role in that big picture. He has a purpose for you. We recoil from the events that play out in our lives because, as I said, the reality often doesn't match the expectation. And we recoil against that and immediately say, oh, God hates me or God's mad at me or I'm doing something wrong. No, that's not at all. It could be that you are walking so faithful God trusts you with the next step of the plan. And it's a doozy. It's going to take you places you didn't realize you're going to have to go. It ain't going to be an easy peasy rose colored ride. It's going to be thorns and briars and rocks. But God trusts you with it because He lets you walk it because He has a big picture in mind. Joseph saw the dreams, and though he didn't know what they meant, 
how he was going to rise up above his family, what it was going to mean that the sheaves were going to bow down. He didn't understand all of that. It didn't really make any sense. But what was happening in his life made no sense either. So what would he do? He would do what was right. He would do what was right. Joseph saw his world turned upside down. But he chose to continue to do what was right. So let's look at it from this perspective. What the world sees as failure, God sees as a tremendous opportunity. Joseph saw his world turned upside down. God saw it as the, the launching pad for the redemption of Israel, the saving of Israel from a real life famine. God saw it as a tremendous opportunity to preserve his people. Jacob saw his hopes and dreams destroyed and gone forever. My favorite loved son is forevermore gone. That's all he could see. His brothers just saw their problem solved. <laughs> Little did they know. The Midianites, they looked at the situation, they saw a prophet. Hey, let's make some money off this kid. It's just a kid. Doesn't mean anything to us. Potiphar? Young, strong, handsome, cheap, goodbye. That's a goodbye. He'll make an awesome servant. It's all Potiphar saw, right? Yet God saw the purpose in the story of Joseph. He saw an opportunity to preserve the nation of Israel, to impact an ungodly kingdom of Egypt with a godly man. God saw what we don't see. God gets what others don't get. When life doesn't make sense, remember this. When life doesn't make sense and circumstances are so bizarre and everyone around you is struggling with what's happening and they're recoiling and they're pulling away and they're name calling and they're isolating you. When all of that is happening, remember, you're not alone in this because God gets it. And God is going to reveal His greatest plan for you in the midst of our struggle. Joseph didn't understand what was going on. He didn't know why this is happening. He's just trying to be a God guy. Just trying to be faithful. Just trying to do what's right. Just trying to live his life in a way that honors God and honors his dad. He, he's not trying to be anything different. He just is something different. Why? Because we'll read, because the Lord was with Joseph. Next week we're going to talk about what happens at Potiphar's house. But the Lord was with Joseph. And I want to remind you, brother and sister in Christ, life may be beating on you right now. And people may be recoiling from you. And people may cut you out of their friend circle. And you might lose like a thousand likes on Facebook. Praise God for that. Best thing you could do. But understand this. In the midst of all of the things and the unknowns for you, it's only unknown for you. God knows. And God sees. God gets it. He has a purpose. And He has a plan. If we'll just walk along with Him, like Joseph did, and do what's right, and honor God, and trust God, He'll reveal it in His time. So today, life beating you down? You got circumstances happening that just make no sense to you? Be encouraged. God's doing something. I didn't say it's fun. Man, half the stuff God has me do is not fun. But it's rewarding because faithfulness leads us to where God is taking us. Maybe today you don't know the Lord. Maybe your first step is saying, dude, I'm not even trusting God. But my life don't make sense. Will you try doing all of this weirdness without God? It will never make sense. But God brings balance and understanding and peace that passes all understanding. Would you call on the name of the Lord today and let Him take control? Heavenly Father, I thank You for the day. 
for the life of Joseph and the lessons that we can learn. God, I'll be the first to admit that I get frustrated with life and I get overwhelmed with circumstances. And I, I think I have to attend to them and fix them and apologize for them and, and do all of the things that basically what I need to do is just be still and do what's right. Let your hand lead me through them. God, you're an amazing and wonderful God. And your intention for us is good. Your desire for us is to walk in faith and in a loving relationship with you. Your, your hope for us is that we find the purpose you created us for and embrace it and walk in it. Even in the midst of, of weird and difficult circumstances, do I trust you with all of it or just the parts that are comfortable? You see, God, before you formed us, you knew us. That's what you told Jeremiah. And you had a purpose for us. And if we would walk in it and not be distracted by the world and the naysayers and the haters, if we would not take every difficult situation as some kind of disciplinary measure from God, but as an opportunity to grow and to draw closer to you, if we would look at life in the big picture, not the immediate circumstance, God, what wonderful things you could do with us in your kingdom. So today, Lord, I, I ask that in the midst of all of our different struggles in life, that we hear your voice saying, peace, my peace I give you. Come after me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, may we trust and know that our circumstances don't define us. It's just where we are right now. But who we are in Christ defines us. As individuals, we are children of God. We are loved of God. We are blessed by God. We are servants of the Most High King. Lord, may we embrace our position and not fret over the circumstance. May we see what you're working in and focus on that. God, I know it's easy to say and hard to do. That's why we, we get in your word and we spend time in prayer. And Lord, may we become so familiar with the voice of the Holy Spirit that there's no question which way to turn. So today, if you're here first, and you say, you know what? I know all about God, but I don't know God. I know the truth of Jesus, but it's not my truth. I pray today that you would make it your truth. That you would walk in a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You would trust Him with all of it. Not just the pieces that you're willing to give up, but all of it. So that the plan of God can unfold before you. Would you ask Christ this day to be your Redeemer, your Savior, and your Lord? My brother and sister, you may be a Christian for a long time, but you've got to admit, the story of Joseph quicks us in the heart, doesn't it? We don't like it, but we know it's reality. So Lord, I want to ask for my brothers and sisters if they find themselves battling and fighting and trying to gain everybody's approval and, and, and trying to, to make life make sense on their own in the flesh, would we stop that today? Would the Holy Spirit just say, stop it, let it down, and just follow me? God, we know your plan is the best plan. We know that you desire all things to work for our good. God, we know that you have something great for every single one of us to do in your kingdom if we will just follow. So Lord, we repent of our flesh and our fears. And I think we come together today and say, God, we trust you. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when I don't know why. Even when everybody else is telling me to let it go. I'm trusting that you get it, God. And you know it. And you will complete in me that which you have begun. By grace through faith in Jesus Christ. In his name. Amen.